thank you for joining us for our second session on earthquakes this afternoon. We have two presenters and a short film. We will start with Alina Bahan, the Executive Manager Corporate and Community Services for the Shire of York, who was responsible for overseeing the renovations at the York Residency Museum as Project Director. Alina will share the best practice techniques that have led to such a great outcome for the Residency Museum. We will then go to Peter Airy, Managing Director of Airy Taylor Consulting Engineers and Scientists. Peter Airy, AM, has been a practicing structural engineer for over 50 years and has, was appointed an honorary fellow by Engineers Australia in 2018. Peter's presentation will focus upon his experience for preventative and remediation treatments for heritage structures in seismic areas. Now we will begin with a short film developed by the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage that provides an overview of the works undertaken at, the, at York's Residency Museum to help the building withstand earthquake damage. We will then hear from Alina and then Peter. Welcome to York, Western Australia. It is difficult to imagine that this peaceful historic town is a potential earthquake hotspot. Unreinforced brick or stone buildings like these are at real risk of earthquake damage. Experience has shown that the impact of an earthquake on these buildings and the economy and social fabric of the town would be devastating. Its status as a popular tourism destination would be lost. That's why government agencies and the local community have come together to find ways to make these buildings more resilient to the damage caused by earthquakes and remain an important part of the town. In Western Australia, the Shire of York is leading the way in this collaborative project. Geoscience Australia and the University of Adelaide have come up with some simple solutions that will help buildings withstand earthquake damage. These simple solutions can be included as part of any conservation or maintenance works. Let's go and take a look. Here we are at the York Residency Museum. Built around 170 years ago, this 1850s building started life as a convict depot and was later used as a maternity hospital. Nowadays it serves as a local history museum. Let's meet the team who are ensuring the York Residency Museum stays standing for future generations of locals and tourists to enjoy. The first stage of planning the project was to work out what was important from a heritage perspective for the building. So this is an older building built in the 1850s so it's really important that we started to find out what the archaeological significance of the place was and, and undertook some work to record those artefacts, find them, just so they could be preserved for future generations and that um, they weren't lost as part of the work that we were doing. So archaeology is not about dinosaurs and it's not about treasure and it's not about gold and it's not about things, it's about people. And one of the really interesting things about this site is that this building was 90% occupied for its entire history by women, but the historical record of this building concentrates only on the men. There's very little in the documentary record or in the historical record about the women who occupied this place. The archaeology tells us all about them. It's a very feminine gendered um, artifact assemblage. It's been created by the things that the women have lost and left behind. Interesting stuff in here. Oh, look at this. Beautiful little flower button or something. And that's gonna enable us to learn a whole heap of things about those people that we can't get from the, the historical record. And that's a fabulous thing. The building elements that are most at risk on this building are the chimneys and the parapet. So you can imagine if they fall, they're gonna do extra damage to the rest of the building. One of the best ways we can protect the Residency Museum into the future is obviously by doing that regular repair and maintenance. So um, that'll help it withstand things like up storms, earthquakes, uh, and even fire. It's provided us lots of opportunity for additional mitigation work. So while the construction crew were here and we had the scaffolding up, we could actually attend to other things such as roof tie downs, um, etc., so that we could prepare the building for other natural disasters. In preparing the scope of work we sought the advice of a structural engineer. Um, he was specialised in heritage buildings and he did the investigation for us and looked into all the ways we could proof the building against earthquakes and then other natural hazards. This building is a pilot project for the regional scheme for mitigating the effects of earthquake in regional towns. This project is, is a shire building that needs conservation. Opportunities being taken to 
restrain those elements which are vulnerable in earthquake, making that connection more ductile in an earthquake situation where walls can fall out, parapets can topple, chimney stacks especially can just sever and drop through buildings. But then the one that's on this side of the chimney, we run it straight through. The next important step was obviously once the scope was prepared, we need to run it past State Heritage so they could ensure that we were undertaking all the right measures to ensure the conservation work was done to best practice. Planning how the simple engineering solutions can be implemented without major changes to the original structure and appearance of the museum has been a primary consideration. We have uh, three chimneys here, two of them are going to be braced in a relatively standard manner as per the retrofitting of earthquake code and one of them is, is much more slender and taller, it's on the perimeter of the building and is more, much more vulnerable and uh, normally one method is to prop that stack externally against the roof but here circumstances are we've been able to be cleverer and, and turn that stack which is not going to be used uh, at all but we are reinforcing it internally with a tension rod which will do the same job that a prop would do but in a much more visually acceptable manner. Simple solutions can be used to reduce damage from earthquakes and other natural hazards. Including these simple solutions with other conservation work helps keep the costs down and protects against expensive repairs or total loss of a building in the event of a natural disaster. It's a good example actually, with it being the lowest category of URMs in the Shire, uh, of which other buildings are people's homes. So this is a former home. So single story, usually with one or two uh, chimney stacks poking through the roof, maybe a gable end. It's got those three elements to it which many people will have in their traditional homes. So they are able to come here and they can look at the detail that we have on drawings, they can look in the roof space to see what this bracing looks like to get a sense of what's involved in installing it. It's important to know that it, you don't need to re-roof your roof to install this bracing, very important. You, know, you also get a feel of cost from this project as well. So we're super excited the work's been conducted to a really high standard and we're so excited again to open it to the public and so for York and the community to be able to come back and see their heritage but also for the wider West Australian community to come and, and understand York as well. An investment now can help safeguard an irreplaceable heritage asset and help in getting appropriate insurance cover. Talk to your local government and heritage department for advice on any necessary approvals and eligibility for grants. Action Now will help save our heritage places for current and future generations to enjoy. Hi everyone and thanks for coming to the conference. Just to share a bit more with you about um, the Residency Museum, we're calling it Dirty Jobs Done Just Right because it was a grubby little project but we think we've done it really well. Um, as you would have heard from the other presenters, you know, we're sitting in a seismic um, high risk area so and Meckering earthquake was a really good example of that. So it's a magnitude of 6.5, that was 6.9 on the Richter scale. And it destroyed the town. So I've said it's 40 kilometres away. I guess it depends which way you travel because Denise said it was 35, but that, <laughs> that's okay. Um, and York's historic buildings really suffered through that. So we did have the Palace Hotel that was unable to be saved. Um, the Imperial Hotel lost its verandas. The, um, the, and these have left, a, particularly the hotel, left a really big gap in our landscape that's still there now. And it would have been a wonderful asset still to have in our townscape if we could still have that. The, the verandas on the Imperial obviously it took 20 years to be resurrected or re, you know, uh, I guess put, put back again anyway. Um, and again, that's a, a major change to the landscape. We're very lucky things like the town hall weren't affected. Um, and we had other buildings that were still there. So if you can see on the photo that I've got, there's the Imperial Museum, uh, sorry, the Imperial Hotel uh, with the town hall in the background. And you can see just the effect of the, the verandas coming off. And you can see below, that's our 
um, motor museum building, you can see how thin and vulnerable those parapets are. You can easily imagine how quickly they would come over in an earthquake event. So the earthquake risk still exists for York and, and all its heritage buildings. Uh, just in the last um, year, we've had two earthquakes come through, um, fortunately not centred here. Uh, so you can see how important it is for us to tackle this top topic. The um, Shire did collaborate with Geoscience Western Australia and the University of Adelaide, plus the University of West Australia, um, DFIS as well, and State Heritage to review those at-risk buildings at York and put in a solution. Um, the York Residency Museum was chosen as a pilot, pretty much so we could test the cost effectiveness of the earthquake strengthening methods in an unreinforced masonry building. Um, and because it represented uh, a lot of the at-risk buildings type surveyed. So it was that unreinforced masonry building. It did have the pre-World War II construct construction. So around 1850, it was um, constructed. It is heritage listed. It's of a residential design, as Peter would have said, you heard Peter talk about in the actual video. The, um, and approximately 85% of the heritage listed buildings surveyed conform to that. So it's a really good test of whether these things can work and whether they can work cost effectively. Um, it is adjacent to the Avon River, and that's quite important because we do have the bedrock that was talked about earlier, I think it was by Mark from Geoscience, um, and we also have sedimentary soil, which goes across that from the river. So that amplifies the seismic risk, so a really good test on that building for that. And we had those simple cost-effective solutions that are applicable nationally. As we've mentioned before, they were done in conjunction with a range of other work to help bring that overall cost down. We, we re-roofed, we did a range of other work to the building as well. Um, you would have heard Peter talk about the chimneys. Um, the study identified the need to restrain the chimneys. And I've got a picture of the one at the Residency Museum that um, Peter was talking about. It's on the edge of the building. It is really, really slender. So being tall and thin, you can imagine that's got a lot of flex in it during a, an earthquake event. They've got really low resilience when that happens. So we applied some internal bracing and steel rod reinforcement to actually put um, some measures in place. So if you can see in our picture, the chimney top, and these details are all courtesy of Peter, who has kindly allowed us to share these. Um, we've got a, a steel plate going across the top and we've got a steel rod tie down that's going all the way through. That still allows the chimney to flex and move a little bit, but keeps it, rather than being rigid, it keeps it mobile, but more secure. Um, the lower detail on that one, so this is the chimney base. So you can see that that's, the rod's coming all the way down and it's sitting on a welder plate that runs from side to side in the chimney. And there's a picture of it there in place. And the beautiful thing about these measures too is um, we've got them in place and you can't see them. They don't affect the interpretation of the building, but they make sure that it's there and available for you to interpret for future generations. We'll have a look at another detail. So wall tires were also added to improve the resilience. Um, you can see a picture of the wall tires being installed. And look at the length of that drill. So that's about a metre long. Um, and that was our Colgan, uh, our construction company, um, sitting along, drilling those into the wall. You can see the detail provided by Peter there. So there's that, that anchor going right down through the wall plate and into the wall. And that actually helps tie the ceiling, uh, sorry, the roof down to the wall, to the wall plate. And that allows, that stops a lot of uplift. So there's lots of situations where you will get uplift in other natural disasters. So bushfire events, you get the sucking effect of the wind trying to take the roof off um, in other high wind events as well. So cyclones or just storms, uh, that's also puts the entire building at risk there. And obviously when the roof comes off, it has the, it can damage the other buildings or other structures um, nearby. It also allows the building to be exposed to other elements such as rain and causes damage there as well. So in terms of an economic benefit, we protect the building from further damage, but also in terms of interpretation and maintaining the heritage fabric that assists us to keep that it's safe as well. Um, I'm just showing you the, the other work that we've been done in the roof space as well. So the new roof went on. Um, it actually assisted us to protect elements we want to preserve. So the original shingles do exist in part of the building. So we could cover over those and make sure they're there and available for future interpretation. Um, we've got the gable end improvements here and gable ends were one of the elements that were needed to be thought about. So obviously there were the chimneys, gable ends were another. Um, 
you can see the additional bracing and structure that's gone in to help protect those and there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of extra metal gone into this building you can see this new brackets and structure where we've got the strapping coming down here and the additional bracing that's come through from the roof as well to uh, just assist it to stay in place um, one of the things that wasn't really discussed in other the other talks um, and we thank Peter for bringing this to our attention was the um, perhaps the ineffectiveness of the fixings of the um, veranda posts so this is how the detail it was previously you can see the post coming down and it's just sitting chocked with no other fastenings chocked onto a couple of bits of timber it's not sitting directly on them you can imagine with a bit of movement that could easily come loose and the whole veranda could come down not unlike the imperial did um, Peter's designed for us a specialist bracket because you can't really get an off-the-shelf solution for this so we've got a situation where you can see on the the other photo where it's been slipped in between so the the original column has been sliced the bracket's been slotted in and then that's secured down to the structure beneath and that is another tied as well as you know reducing any sideways movement it's actually tying that building down further as well so it'll actually increase its ability to withstand storm events and wind events as well as seismic activity and while we were there we did a lot of other work to the building as well one of the things that was important to us too was uh, reducing the soil level around a building and this is something that happens to a lot of heritage structures over time the ground levels build up whether it's through you know brick paving or other landscaping gardens etc and you find that the the soil starts to encroach onto the structure underneath the building frequently their timber as was ours and what that does is increase the damp into that space so i'm doing a lot of hand gestures which you guys can't see but um with that we so we excavated the soil away we reduced the ground levels and we're just making sure that all, we could take advantage of some of the inbuilt damp protection that was already there in the masonry walls and encouraging that preservation of the timber fabric whether it's existing or new and that again helps keep that building whether it's um during a, a disaster or a storm event stops it soaking up additional water but it also or it stops water being directed to that building but it also means that um it, it's just again just over time it'll just increase its resilience to the effects of aging um what made this awesomely award-winning loads of things the really important part was this was this collaboration with expert bodies so we had right from the beginning we were involved with geoscience australia um, and the university of adelaide uh, department of planning lands and heritage and department of fire and emergency services so we we're right there with everyone who had a really good idea about this and we were willing and able to um, be a pilot project for that um, if you were thinking about this yourself, whether it's whether you get the opportunity to work with um, such amazing colleagues or whether you're just doing it on, off your own bat, um, we included heritage professionals at every stage. So you absolutely must be speaking to um, the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage for and the state heritage um, staff just to just test at every point what you're thinking of doing and making sure that, that it fits in with conservation, good sound conservation techniques and uh, that you've got the go ahead for, for that. We also employed um, heritage professionals with a structural engineer and his assistant architect for the drawings. Uh, that was Peter Baxendale, you would have seen on the video earlier. And um, in turn, uh, we also made sure that when we were selecting our construction team, that we employed people with really strong heritage credentials. And we went with Colgan for our um, for our build and, and they did a fantastic job and at every point because of their experience we could test things out with them test things out with the engineer and bring our own experience to bear on that project as well um, in addition to them we also as you would have seen in the video um, we have wanted to bring on archaeologists as well because when you're disturbing the ground in, a, in an important older site as such as this you're going to find things and and we did and you would have seen um, the, the amazing things that actually changed our interpretation of what this building was and who was actually using it it is actually a very woman-centered building although it's you know considered magistrates or um sorry the residency museum um and it's a very male dominated idea it, it actually housed nurses and families and and those are the artifacts that we found so that's going to be telling that story and we'll soon have those dis on display at the residency museum as well um, other things that made this awes awesomely award-winning was the intent of the Shire to do the very best it could right from the beginning. So we knew we had to, um, we, ha we were lucky to have on staff um, 
Carol Littlefair, who's uh, a very amazing um, curatorial uh, professional. And so she was also guiding us what to look for, um, what things we might find in the rafters that'd be unusual, what signs and things to look for where there may be artifacts that we could find. Um, also, you know, my, I have experience also with heritage buildings and in, in the architectural sense. Um, and we could all bring that, that to bear and just understand when we needed to do better. So we did, we had our original budget for the project. We did increase that as we went along and sought assistance from state heritage and from, you know, redirecting money so that we could do where we needed more archaeology or put some more money into the building fabric. We constantly did that because we wanted that very best outcome for the building, for the town and for the state. So that that's, again, why we think it's awesomely award-winning. Um, that preservation of the important heritage asset uh, was important, but without interfering with its interpretation. So we could have maybe braced the chimneys in a different way. We could have tied the building down in a different way. But actually, when you go look at it, and you can see from the picture now, it looks pretty much like it did at the beginning, only a little bit fresher. Um, and that's what you want. You don't want it to be changed in a way that makes it impossible to tell what it used to be. Um, and the other important point is actually the applications of these me methods are national applications. So it can be applied to a, a small residential dwelling in York, uh, in Adelaide, in, in Hobart. Um, all of that can be, you know, repurposed for anyone else that wanted to, to go ahead with that. Um, I did have my next slide just says uh, questions, but I know we're doing the panel later, so I'll leave it till then. Thanks very much. My name is Peter Herring. I'm a consulting engineer and have been for many years. Um, I have lived through the Mecklenburg earthquake and the reconstruction of many things which followed it. And uh, I intend today to give a broad view of the seismic effects on heritage buildings and some detailed answers to how that effect can be minimised. Maybe try to say but earthquakes are essentially ground waves. The ground wave emanates from the movement of large elements of the tectonic plate and the location for which the earthquake emanates is termed the epicentre. The, the wave has both vertical and horizontal components is very visible. Depending on the, the source the scale of movement can vary substantially. The intensity of the earthquakes is measured by a scale developed by a man called Richter in 1935, which is pretty recent, really. Um, Australia received, it has many more earthquakes than most people are aware of. On average, Australia records 700 earthquakes a year occurring all over the country. WA is the most active, both in the size and number of earthquakes. Fortunately, most of Australia's earthquakes are magnitude two and three events, which only cause light shaking, but no damage. It's not until events of magnitude four and above that you start to get minor damage to property, like dishes falling off shelves, windows breaking and plaster cracking. Above magnitude five on the Richter scale, you start to see damage to houses and buildings. Earthquakes are significantly damaging the scale of 5.5 and 8.9 in magnitude. At the upper end of the scale, they are devastating and often take lives. To put this into a real world context, the 1968 Meckering earthquake, which is the most damaging earthquake in the recorded history of Western Australia, was 6.5 on the Richter scale. This was pretty devastating as these Im images show. What isn't shown is the effect on the humans that were around at the time. Fortunately, despite the devastation you see, not many people were damaged. However, one of the effects it had was on women who were expecting babies. My ba baby wasn't expected then, but it arrived next day. <laughs> Prior to 1968, the incidence of seismicity in Australia in the 5.5 to 8.9 magnitude range was so small that designing buildings to resist earthquakes was not a concern for architects or engineers. This all changed in 1968. 
in Western Australia, we realised this there was the potential for a problem that needed to be addressed in our designs. As a practising engineer at the time, I was then designing the um, Pan Pacific Hotel, now called, then called the Sheraton. It was a 26 storey building and we had no code based guidance in Australia as to how to design for the forces generated by seismic quakes. I looked for guidance as to how to design for earthquakes. And of course, there was since there was no code in Australia, the logical thing was to look to New Zealand for ex their experience. I consulted our Kiwi cousins who, who live on what is a really shaky set of islands. We used the forces that they had in their code called Half Zone C to design the Pan Pacific Hotel. And it sounds laughably small to a New Zealander, but to us as practitioners in this side of the country, it changed things. The sheer walls that stabilised the Pan Pacific was hugely more than required to resist lateral loads from the wind. The acceleration coefficient, which is really a measure of the lateral load created by the, the ground wave on the building, adopted was about 9%. This 9% is 9% of the mass of the building moving laterally. Then there was some, another event. In Newcastle in 1989, there was an earthquake which occurred, which measured 5.6 on the Richter scale and resulted in deaths. There's nothing to smarten up people writing codes with deaths. 13 people were killed and 160 were injured. After the Mackering and Newcastle events, the Australian Code was formulated for the design of buildings subject to seismic loads. This is all very well for new buildings, but you be, must be aware most heritage buildings were designed before 1968 when there was no formal code or general practice to design buildings effectively for quake events. There are heritage buildings around. Heritage buildings vary enormous in scale, enormously in scale and texture. What you see presented is one of the most famous heritage buildings on earth. It is the Parthenon in Athens, Greece. It has been in position for 2,000 years and properly designed for seismic events. It is an area where seismicity is a real design factor. The designers at the time thought about seismicity and came up with a unique answer that really worked. What they discerned was the ground wave of an earthquake has a lateral component and a vertical component which needed to be dealt with if a building of the scale of the Parthenon was to be placed safely on the site. What they concluded was that the lateral shearing forces of the earth needed to be prevented from causing the columns to bend and that vertical forces need to be abated as much as possible. How did they do it? What they did was unique and effective. They placed large stacked beds of animal hides separated by brush underneath each of the columns. The animal hides allowed the translational impetus of the earthquake to be avoided and the vertical forces were minimised by the stack of energy absorbent material. Ladies and gentlemen, this was 2,000 years ago. It was really great thinking. The damage you see to the Parthenon is not due to seismic events, but due to the actions of man during a war. Buildings in the Pilbara are designed for to withstand cyclonic wind loads. And because of this, are remarkably well equipped to withstand earthquakes. Luckily, we need to understand how to design buildings for the forces generated by earthquakes. While the forces involved in earthquakes are different to cyclones, if buildings are designed for cyclonic wind loads, our seismic 
the loads are comparatively small and the buildings are able to accept them without damage. This applies to many of the buildings in the Pilbara area and the north of the state, particularly near the coast. A good recent example is the aftermath of a magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake that hit 200 kilometres off the coast from Broome. The worst damage experienced was to the freestanding cabinets overturning, as you can see in the picture on screen. This occurred in shopping centres and was widespread. The buildings themselves had remained intact or were undamaged. The heritage buildings in the south of the state are a difficult construction. Their designs drew on English experience, much of which did not include a necessary provision for earthquakes. Nevertheless, addressing civic significant basic engineering issues, such as the centre of stiffness being aligned with the centre of mass, greatly assists any building to avoid seismic damage. If the centre of stiffness and centre of mass are not aligned, the buildings tend to spin around the centre of stiffness during a seismic event causing damage at the corners of the building. The heritage building shown, which is quite tall, has quite rectilinear proportions and is reasonably well configured to resist mild earthquakes, as is the clock tower. There was a clock tower in York which I was asked to remediate after the Mecca earthquake, York being quite close to the epicenter. This required some work on the corners, but not a lot. It had no serious bracing in the plane of the roof and it still survived quite well. Question of uh, chimneys was raised by Peter Baxendale. And this received a lot of attention post the Neckering earthquake. We used a technique which is somewhat similar to that used by him, but in my opinion, somewhat better, and it's available to every, anybody to use, and that is to post tension in the chimneys. This can be done quite readily by using BBR rods, which are a high tensile rod, and squeezing the, the brickwork into compression by using similar principles to that described by Peter, but actually compressing the brickwork. Now, that's one suggestion for quake resistance. To give existing buildings good resistance to minor seismic actions, ensuring that the roof membrane is properly engaged to the walls of the building is an important facet of design, even if engaged retroactively. This can be checked on heritage buildings and corrected if, if absent. Following the Newcastle earthquake in, in 1989, the decay by rusting of galvanised wire tyres restraining the external leak of the roof walls was found to be the predominant factor in, in structural damage and associated deaths. As the external walls were effectively freestanding, they collapsed and were subject to the lateral loads of the earthquake. Salt in coastal areas, and most of our bigger cities are in coastal areas, causes galvanised wire ties to rust out. All of our modern coasts now request that stainless steel wire ties were used in areas subject to risk degradation or plastic wire tires, both of which do not degrade by rusting. There are many buildings in Perth and Western Australia that should have retroactive installation of stainless wire, wire tires. This includes public buildings and heritage buildings. Wire tires have been developed which can be fitted to existing walls by drilling into the walls and affixing them without reconstructing the entire wall. An example of this a type of refixing arrangement which is used to retrofit walls is shown on the screen. This arrangement is marketed by two firms I'm aware of and is generally available. It was developed as a perceived need 
following the Newcastle problem. This is particularly important for heritage buildings. Prior to 1960, stainless steel wire tires were not available in Western Australia and were not used. Checking the status of the wire tires and heritage assets is sensible and retrofitting of the type described can be very cost effectively done from either inside or outside the building and does not manifest itself in the disfiguring of the building. A more holistic look at the building is a, sometimes worth doing. Buildings with heavy roofs such as tile roofs are far more vulnerable to damage from seismic events than those with light weight roofs. This is due to what is known colloquially as the toffee apple effect because earthquakes shake affected tile roofs much as you would shake a toffee apple. Considerable care is required to ensure the roof membrane action is resisted by the walls which have to act in shear. This is a detailing and configuration issue. Chimneys are even worse, but there is a very good solution available which we use, which is post-tensioning them. After meckering, one option which was used other than the sort of answers that Peter's portrayed today and I'm talking about, was that the roof sheeting were lifted if, if tiles and the area adjacent to the chimney sheeted out with um, ply so that if the chimney did collapse, it didn't become a, a, a nemesis to anybody inside. <coughs> Where possible when you're conducting maintenance on heritage assets, thought could be given to roofing replacement with lightweight alternatives. It does not disrupt the heritage nature of the asset. Western Australia has many buildings which have box shell construction, comprising relatively small rooms, load bearing, often brick walls, concrete floors, and eventually a roof. This configuration is typically found in apartment buildings but also of, that gen of the period we're talking about, but also seen in hotels and schools, some of which are heritage listed. Construction of this type was given very good in-service duty in seismic events, so long as they do not have what is called a soft story. A soft story is created when the lowest or lower levels have a different occupancy to the occupancy of the upper floor. It is typically a commercial tenancy or car park under apartments above and, and above a transfer floor. Many buildings now being built in Perth have a soft story. Heritage buildings, or those built prior to 1950 of this type, rarely had soft stories, so they are effectively more stable and are given very good service during the major seismic event. What you see on the screen is a building which is 20 stories high in South Perth, which was designed by a, an engineer who just died last year, George Kativa. This building suffered no damage during the Meckering earthquake and was in place. Stability in some heritage buildings is enhanced by timber floors, which restrain them. This, I must add, I'm, I'm saying this more about multiple floors. Where the timber floors are engaged to the external walls, they provide very good membrane action distributing the loads better and restraining the walls from moving out laterally, particularly if there are no wire tire problems. Still, stability is often enhanced by the historic practice of using walls which are more than one leaf bonded together. This, is, this type of building is present in St George's Terrace with timber floors abutting walls which become progressively less thick higher. This, this arrangement gives immensely better stiffness to the walls and better to res resistance to bending than modern, modern cavity wall construction. 
So the, intrinsically, they have a, a strength which is really never was intended to have to resist seismicity, but is the present. In summary, earthquakes are a significant factor in Western Australia that should be considered for heritage asset protection. Some basic to measures to enhance protection are check the roof membrane is effectively engaged to the walls. Check and augment existing wire ties and augment the tying together of the external walls with stainless steel options of the type now commercially available. Consideration to replacing heavily heavy tile roofing with lightweight alternatives is some, something which could be given consideration. Uh, also, if the building is of more than one level, making sure the flooring locks in effectively with the external walls is useful. For chimneys, post tensioning the chimneys offers a, a real solution, but the chimneys have to be very effectively tied into the roof structure as well. Lastly, having a, a professional structural engineer report on your asset is always recommended, particularly if there are multiple concerns. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me. I'll be pleased to answer any questions you may have.